Hi guys, you're so welcome to another session here on Narc Con and Remy and myself have just gotten in from a freezing cold walk and we're thawing out by the fire. And I really felt like communicating with you something as a follow on from some client sessions, one to one sessions that occurred this morning. So it is a discussion in relation to the layers of abuse and how they layer on top of each other when you're in a medium to long term relationship with a narcissist usually. It's the best way to describe it, and we came up with this term this morning for it, is ownership grooming. So I'd really like to explain it because a lot of people cannot fathom how when they get out of a relationship with a narcissist, can't figure out how they stayed in the relationship with the narcissist, can't figure out where they lost themselves, at what junction they lost themselves, and how the narcissist actually managed to get them to the state of such dependence on the narcissist. So let's get into it because understanding what happened to us is very freeing in that we can depersonalize it a lot more and not allow ourselves to get into that situation again with anybody going forward. So this is a phrase that I've come up with and I think it best describes what I'm going to describe now. Ownership grooming. What is it? Essentially, it's the narcissist seeing themselves as omnipotent. The narcissist with people in their lives doesn't see those people as being individuals with their own needs and likes and wants. They don't respect your individual authority. They don't see you as separate from them. They believe once you're within their circle or they've chosen to be with you or you're part of their family, that they actually own you, that you are literally an extension of them. You're literally one of their arms or one of their legs. You're with them. You must never be against them. And you essentially must be controlled by their brain. So effectively, they're looking for you to shut your brain down, to shut your identity down, to shut your soul down and become a robot, robotic slave, I suppose, is the best way to describe it, to meet their needs and only their needs, to not object to them, to admire them greatly and to be very interested in them, to be there as a punch bag to take their abuse when somebody else has deregulated them, perhaps outside the home or outside the family. So in order for them to get you to be the perfect source of supply, they need to groom you into that role. And this process happens over time. It's a very, in some ways, subtle process, because if it wasn't subtle, you would go, what the heck do you think you're doing? What's happening to me here? This isn't right. So it's what I would describe, best describe as an ownership grooming, brainwashing process that is a covert process in order for you not to be alarmed by the layers upon layers upon layers of psychological, emotional and sometimes physical abuse. And definitely, as you know, in my book, spiritual abuse perpetuated by a narcissist in particularly in the intimate relationship with a narcissist. But also it can be years of a parent or a child in reverse doing it to a family member they live with or have close connections or contact with. One of the things they start off by doing, I suppose, if you want to look at it as a, a course in ownership, grooming, management that the narcissist inflicts on their targets, you could say as a start off, they start to tell you what you like. So if you suggest something 
that they don't want to do. Because they don't see you as separate, they'll use the you term and say, you don't like going there. And they're literally not in not letting you be an individual, but saying you in terms of talking to their arm. No arm, like we won't do, we won't play tennis today because you don't like doing that. Yet it's their arm. So they're thinking for you and they're developing you into them. So they're effectively telling you what they don't like doing and then you agree as part of them. I hope that doesn't sound too difficult to grasp or too spacey, but effectively, psychologically, the narcissist is disallowing your particular likes, wants and needs and telling you what you like, want and need because you are part of the collective, part of them. So over time, you say, well, why wouldn't you object to that? Over time, if you do object to it, they'll say, go along to the function that you really want to go to, but they didn't want to go to. And they will make that function such an objectionable, awful experience for you. And they may repeat that on numerous occasions, even over, say, a two year period where you eventually, when they say you don't like doing that, you eventually go, what's the point? It's going to be awful if he or she comes with me. So you agree and you do something else. So that's the first beginner's course in the narcissist's ownership grooming, I would say. Then the next stage would be. monitoring the monitoring of you and the micromanaging and that may be always wanting to know where you are what you're doing what you're thinking who you're seeing who you're meeting and what you really want to do and what your plans are for the day they need you to serve them and to be a backup for them they need you not to go near anybody that's going to influence you if it's the beginning of the relationship, not to influence you to such an extent that they're going to lose control over you or their control is going to be threatened. The situations where this type of layering of abuse works best, because in the modern type of relationship, if they lay this type of stuff on, too quickly in the beginning, people will be out of there. People won't want it. People will be alerted to the red flags that are being presented to them. These situations invariably are these manipulations or the ownership grooming work best in situations where the narcissist has already consecutive, consecutively or at the same time manage to get you into a situation where you may be financially dependent on them, where you've just had a baby and your self-agency is at an all-time low, where you're actually very dependent on the support and help of people around you. You maybe have given up your job because the narcissist will encourage you to do that. Or you're in a situation where your morals or your religious beliefs would conflict with you leaving the particular narcissist at a particular given time. Or you may be in a country, you may not be in your own country or you're in your own location. You may be totally devoid of any kind of financial ability to get out of the relationship. This is usually, these are usually the situations where the ownership grooming will escalate at a quicker rate because of your inability to have an alternative, an easy alternative, let us put it like that. Coupled with that difficulty in getting out of the relationship with the narcissist, the narcissist has more confidence in escalating the ownership management of you. 
Now, another thing they will do in this process, and I'd kind of call it the third stage, is a gas light that's brought in again slowly, but it nearly paralyzes a person from even taking any action or having any thought that's individual or that opposes the narcissist's agenda. Let me explain. If, for instance, with the micromanaging that the narcissist has done and the telling you what you should and shouldn't like, if, for instance, you're, say, going to the, to the store and the narcissist asks you, what time are you leaving? What time are you coming back? And where exactly are you going? Supposing on the way home from the store, you call in the store in question or whatever your destination was, you decide that you'd like to call in to another store or to a restaurant or whatever you want to do. You realise that your time short and that if you do this, you'll have to really hurry because you're going to not meet your deadline to be home when you said you were going to be home. And you know from the past that this is problematic that you're going to get questioned, that you're maybe going to get a sulky mood, that things are not going to go well, basically. You're not going to get a good reception from the narcissist. However, you really want to go in there. You need to go in there. So you take the risk and in you go for five minutes, something that you want to do for yourself. Lo and behold, when you get home, after a certain period of time, the narcissist questions you about where you were, how did your day go, etc. And looks at you and you don't tell the narcissist that you've been in this particular place because they don't like you going in there, maybe, or whatever. Or you just you don't want to cause trouble. And you know at this stage in the relationship that that could cause contention. The narcissist says, oh, so-and-so, Johnny was on to me and said he saw you in, blah, blah, into the place that you went where you shouldn't have gone. This type of information that comes back to the narcissist from probably an innocent bystander is definitely going to be used against you. So you say, oh, yes, I did go in there. And the narcissist says, why keep it a secret? You know, why Why would you keep that a secret? And again, you start to get the questioning and you get the, I know where you were, you didn't tell me, you're being duplicious, you're being deceitful. And you know that if you had told the narcissist you'd gone in there, you would have gotten an earful because they had disapproved of the place that you went. The narcissist will take an opportunity like this to gaslight you into thinking that the next time you go to the store that they know and they have big brother on you, that they have surveillance on you and that they will somehow know that you've deviated from the said plan. Even if you go to the store, the same route and the same story happens, say, six times and you think to yourself, Look, you know, I'm being silly. I should go in there. I need to go in there. I want to go in there. You go back to the narcissist having done that and you think, I've gotten away with that. See, they don't know everything. You know, it's just, they, they can't know everything. They're just a normal person. And they question you about, well, how, how did it go? Did you get the things, you know, you were going to get? And anything else you want to tell me? And the target or the victim of the narcissist, because they've been gaslit into thinking that the narcissist knows everything, their every movement and has surveillance out there and is all knowing, is, is God literally, is omnipotent and knows everything. When the narcissist says, is there anything else you'd like to tell me? The narcissist doesn't actually know what you've done, but they know by asking that question, that you're in such fear of them and believe they know everything that you say you're afraid. Will I tell them? Won't I tell them? Will I tell them? Won't I tell them? And the target or the victim comes out with, well, actually, I did go into that store again 
and the narcissist is off on a tangent as to your deceptiveness, as to why you shouldn't go into that store, as to they can't let you out of their sights, as to what a bad person you are, etc., 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 and you get duly punished for your deceptive nature. This gaslighting that the narcissist does really over time convinces a lot of people when they're trying to make an escape plan that they will be found out, that it's hopeless, that the narcissist always seems to find out what they're doing one way or another. And the narcissist does indeed set various people up in your inner circle as flying monkeys by selling them stories of something like, what? how could it go, that you are not doing too good at the moment, your mental health isn't very good, um, they're worried about your memory and in fact they heard that you were wandering, um, you know, you crossed the road without looking, you were wandering into such and such a store and they really were concerned for you and they thought they were going to get you help and could so and so or could these people keep an eye out for you and let the narcissist know if they thought you were doing anything untoward or out of character. So they do indeed set up a series of flying monkeys to feed them back intel on what you're doing. So although it's it's a gaslight that you think that the narcissist is all knowing, they do have practical steps and use the fact that they know that you're afraid of them to ask leading questions even when they don't have the information to extract information out of you in the confidence that the gas lighting of you has worked and that you're afraid not to tell them what you've been up to. The next thing they will do, guys, in relationship to their ownership grooming of you, where you feel that you are a piece of property, that you feel that even though they're your partner, you're their lesser, you're their employee, so to speak, or their prisoner in the worst of circumstances. Another thing that they will do that's highly abusive and highly layered, because, for instance, if somebody, say, the best way to, to describe the contrast of what this abuse is and what, I suppose, abuse on the first level is, I would call first level abuse, say, a physical abuse where one person hits the other. That person knows they've been hit and that person can report that and say that they've been hit. So it it's a fact, even though the narcissist will deny it, whatever. But at least you know it occurred and at least you know it's abuse. And at least maybe somebody else may have witnessed it or you have it on camera or you report it and it's there on a police report. The hardest thing to identify oftentimes is the layered abuse of a narcissist. One of these abuse techniques, besides the gaslighting and the ownership monitoring of you, and this is part of the ownership grooming, is dog whistling. And no, that's not me. <laughs> whistling for Remy as we go out on a walk. This is essentially, you are the only person that hears the narcissist whistling because the whistle is directly for you and on a wavelength that only you will pick up. And here's how that goes. You're maybe going out to a function and the narcissist has picks an argument with you before you go out for various different reasons, but one of the main reasons is you were looking forward to the event maybe so that you will not enjoy it and that they can feature more prominently as the superior person or as the only person who's important and the only person who's going to enjoy it. You'll be in the background looking grumpy and glum and that's the effect they want and that's how they want people to see you. Well, you may be out at the event and the narcissist will say something very personal, but will seem to be saying it 
to praise you or so that you'd like it and they'll say it out loud. But this is something that you haven't wanted to share with people. Maybe, for instance, you're pregnant and you hadn't wanted to tell anyone for the next two months and you'd express that to the narcissist and the narcissist had agreed. But at the gathering, they announce and we have brilliant news to tell you and, you know, so and so is is pregnant and cheers and congratulations and everybody now knows the news. The only person that knows how distressed and distraught you are about what the narcissist has just done is you. They look over into your eyes with satisfaction and glee because they know of the abuse that they have just perpetuated on you and no one else can see it. And you're left conflicted because you're thinking, well, it's a nice thing that they've done, but I really didn't want that to happen. I don't have any agency over my own decisions. The narcissist has just broken a boundary. You never think that with that clarity in the situation. You just feel emotionally in turmoil. And should you react out of the expected or expectations, societal expectations, and suddenly, you know, go crazy at the narcissist like you, you might like to do or fling your hat at him or fling whatever you have at him or her, whatever, you have to refrain from doing that because if you do, you look crazy and people are wondering what the heck's wrong with you. Unless there's great friends and family who know what's going on, who understand the intricate layering of that particular narcissist's abuse. That essentially is just an example of dog whistling where you are the only one that picks up on that wavelength the narcissist is giving out to you. And it's actually a lashing to you, but seen by everybody else as being something wonderful. And you are isolated in that moment of abuse. And it's the cumulative effect of that narcissist's ownership of you that is so hideous, so heinous, so abusive, and so destructive that people, when they're trying to find their way out from under the layers and find themselves again, find it difficult unless they get this information, unless they get the aha moments and say, yes, that was me, or yes, that's happening to me right now. And I can't explain it to anyone because there's nothing to kind of explain. I don't know how to put it in words that I'm being absolutely tortured and tormented and pulled apart in small little pieces and the pieces are on the floor and I can't find myself to put myself together because I can't look for help because I can't explain why I'm feeling so bad. And oftentimes people in this state, if they can't actually totally extricate themselves from the narcissist, and remember, the narcissist has in general, where they have the ownership management of someone, cut off the financial independence and self-agency of the person. It is a nightmare. It's very difficult, but possible to get out of. The more you understand the narcissist, the narcissistic personality disorder, and what's happening to you and your part in it as you became the person under the layers of this creeping, slow, subtle, disgusting abuse of one person to another. Understanding is the first step, guys, then getting financial and otherwise independence and leaving the narcissist before the narcissist carts you off to be mentally assisted in a breakdown you may have because you don't know how to put into words what's actually occurring. The narcissist may not be hitting you physically, but by God, they're throwing punches at you in a spiritual sixth dimension realm is the best way I can describe it, in the destruction of you, your soul, your identity, 
and your personal authority and your right, your right to have a life, to live with your own decisions, your own destiny, your own purpose. How dare they take that away from you? But oftentimes you have to make the break and that takes a lot of courage when basically they have stripped you of the confidence and the peace to make such a decision because you live literally in a world of chaos where you believe you're being monitored 24 seven in the biggest gaslight the narcissist has ever done to you or anyone. Getting out of that is a process and Oftentimes people will say, well, look, somebody's been abused. Why don't they just walk out? It's never as simple as that. So be patient if you're in that type of relationship. Get the knowledge as much as you possibly can. Depersonalize it as much as you possibly can. Seek outside help and support and strive for some type of financial independence or some type of understanding within your community. If you're in a community that doesn't accept separation, you know, that looks badly on people who are married, separating, etc. There's so many different circumstances where these creatures operate and operate at their maximum power in situations where people are particularly vulnerable. And that's it for now, guys. We will be back again very shortly with another podcast. I will leave you in a January, on a January day with Remy at the fire. And I hope that you're all stay warm, stay well, stay, stay safe, keep getting educated, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Guys, it's a little click of the button for you. It's a big thing for me. So thank you very much for being here and I'll see you with you.